as um, I was introduced, I do this talking, uh, this type of talk regularly, but uh, I love to do it in Canada because people are so nice here. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, I still, um, I always try to tease out some of the uh, local similarities between Germany and the place uh, that I go to. And here we are already at the first similarity, which is we also have a lot of our uh, power generation capacity based on coal. And I learned that Alberta does the same thing. So in this slide, we have, uh, it shows you we have 19% of hard coal power generation and 24% of lignite power generation, also 13% of natural gas. And then we, in 2010, still had 23% of nuclear power, which we'll not have in the future. You also see in this slide that we have an increasing number of renewables that make up small but more and more important wedges of this pie. Um, this actually means biogas, I'm sorry, the bio got cut off there. This is what uh, surprises me on a daily basis about German power sector, because when I was growing up, uh, it was the golden age of building nuclear power plants in Germany, and my teachers told me 4% of hydro in Germany is all we can do in terms of renewables. And this slide shows you how wrong teachers can be sometimes. I have a daughter who's going to school next year, so I have to add this sometimes now. Uh, another, another similarity between Alberta and Germany is the solar radiation. These, uh, unfortunately, the, the color scales on these two slides are somewhat off because one is from a German source and the other is from Natural Resources Canada by way of Tim Weiss. Thank you very much. But it, uh, it shows you that in southern Alberta you have uh, much better solar resource than we have in southern Germany. If you go to Freiburg, you're happy to get 1,100 kilowatt hours per kilowatt. And um, I think the orange scale is uh, 1,200 to 1,300, which doesn't look like a big difference, but it's a 10% difference in, in terms of profitability of your solar system or a 10% uh, reduction in terms of the generation price for solar PV from your solar system. But this is actually where the similarities end, and on all the other counts, you are much more uh, in a much better position to deploy renewables than we are, because you have lots of land, you have lots of wind, and you have not as many people as we have. We have 18 million people in uh, an area that's half the size of Alberta, so 80, 80. So it's crowded. If you've been there, you notice it's crowded. We don't, and you need space to develop renewables. So all the more surprising uh, that we actually can show a success story in renewable energy. We have hundreds of thousands of solar roofs and solar collectors. We have more than 21,000 wind turbines uh, turning in Germany. We have more than 4,500 4, biogas plants and wood boilers. And these together provide 20% of our electricity, about 9% of our heat. And these together are reducing our import dependence, which is a big issue in Germany, unlike in Alberta. They provide around 300 to 400,000 jobs. Um, they also provide opportunities for energy entrepreneurship, so people can be their own utility, which is a complete change of paradigm from before. They avoid almost 120 million tons of CO2 per year. and uh, uh, this all happens in a heavily industrialized country with little domestic resources and very little space, as I said. This is how it grew from the times when my teachers told me about 4%, which is what you see on the far left of the slide. And this is how, how the system sizes grew uh, over the last 20 years. This is how the jobs grow in, in the renewable energy as compared to the other energy industries in Germany. So the big question for all of us is how did that happen? How in the world? And uh, I'm German, we are very organized, so the, the cliché says us, and we do everything with a plan, but this, this was really not very planned. It took 20 years and we have politics and politicians and policies and they shift and move back and forth. And we were very, very lucky that by a series of coincidences, we had a very, very stable framework that remained in place for 20 years. 
here you can see how, how the growth uh, goes through a number of different energy metrics. The first one is the share of renewable energy in total final energy consumption, meaning all the three forms of energy that we use combined, which are electricity, heat, and transportation fuels. And we, we went up from 4% in the year of 2000 to 10.9%. Um, which is considerable, but the European Union is actually pushing us to go to 18% by 2020. This is part of the European Union's directive, the so-called 2020 rule. We'll have to, uh, across Europe, reduce our energy consumption by 20%, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 20%, and provide 20% of our final energy from renewables. The European Union did a table that gives every country how much they have to do. Poor Swedes have to do over 50%. We have to do only 18%, which is quite a bit if you think about my teachers. But we find that we are on a good track. We are confident that we can make this. We are very confident in the electricity sector because the electricity law that we have provided the backbone for the growth that we have experienced so far and we think we find ways how to make it um, continue providing a stable framework to be able to grow up to 25, maybe even 35 percent. This is all come through the program that I'm going to talk about at length. We're not as successful in ter terms of turning up the uh, renewable heat switch. We have no good policies on that end. We are doing miserably on fuels because of our restricted land. We have only limited uh, crops that we can convert into fuels and there is an issue with importing them. People don't like to import them uh, because they think that we will uh, devastate the rainforest in Indonesia and the Philippines and maybe Brazil and they probably have a point. Uh, so we have no solutions currently in, in the renewable fuel side. Um, but overall, we're not doing too badly in terms of reaching our goals. So the backbone that I was talking about is the famous uh, uh, Renewable Energy Sources Act. People like to call it a feed-in tariff. I think this is, uh, it has nothing to do with food. It has nothing to do with fair tariffs and where the in goes, I have no idea. But uh, so I call it, uh, taking from Ontario, a standard offer program, because that's what it is. It's a standard offer. It just means that if you want to do it, you can have very clear and defined uh, rules according to which you can do it. It's open for everybody, and it basically says that the utility, the demand, uh, the uh, distribution system operator has to build a grid connection to your facility. They have to bear the cost of this uh, grid connection. They have to purchase the power that comes from your renewable electricity facility and they have to buy that at all times whenever you want to produce, which is important for wind and solar, which uh, cannot be um, regulated as well. The rate is set by the law and is set such that it just is enough to just recover your equipment costs. It's not a, a huge rate, actually it was part of my dissertation to calculate that rate. And uh, we see from who is investing in Germany that it's not a rate that our utilities would like to achieve with any kind of investment. So we're confident that this is a, 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 slow, a low enough rate to uh, avoid skimming and, um, uh, and free riding. But the rate is paid over a very long time frame of 20 years. And this together, the risk freeness of the investment and the long tenor makes it a very boring investment, one that people could put their pension funds into, their IRAs, and people do that. So it's, it's not something that allows for a lot of um, gaming with the money, um, playing, or as I said, uh, skimming off margins. It's a, a boring investment like your home or like other um, retirement funds. The rate that is guaranteed by the law goes down every year by a specified percentage. That's called degression, and that has a twofold uh, purpose. One is that it ensures that the tariff, the rate, stays 
at this low cost recovering level at all times because equipment prices go down. If the rate would not go down, people would just wait until they get lower equ equipment at lower prices, same tariff, higher margin. So the, the, that's why the, the rate goes down every year so that this is not incentivized. And in fact, it incentivizes the second thing, which is early action. You don't gain anything by waiting for lower equipment prices. That's why you can as well invest today. And in fact, people often invest shortly before the time when the digression hits. So even in December, we'll have an investment boom because the 1st of January is the day when the, uh, pri the rates go down. So this is the package. It has three layers, as I said. It's, it has the digression layer, it has the uh, grid connection layer, and it has the obligation to purchase by the DSO. And all of this makes it possible that uh, you don't have to have a lot of electricity sector knowledge in order of how, how can I market my power. You can just use this like your retirement account. It's just a normal investment. And uh, summing up the advantages, uh, they are simple, stable, fair, effective, equitable in a way. All these factors reduce the total cost of deploying renewables, lower risks, lower transaction costs, uh, lead to maximize deployment activity and also uh, lead to the fact that renewable equipment in Germany is, is among the lowest priced in the world. For example, for solar PV, Germany is the price setting market. And if you go to other markets that, for example, uh, support solar PV deployment with investment subsidies you, and you compare the prices, you can see that the prices are higher just exactly by the amount of the investment subsidy meaning in these places the investment subsidy is not actually helping the person who invests but is helping the producers to just skim some margins. Germany has, has managed to be the lead market and to set the prices. So I can only recommend any, any other place that, that puts in place these, uh, some kind of any kind of investment uh, or um, support scheme to look at the German market. This is also something like an international price benchmark to everybody. The industry likes that too, because the industry in Germany has a long-term perspective for investment in the supply chain, in producing the equipment, in, but also in providing the equipment, in maintaining the equipment, just caring for the equipment. And the system is open for everybody. We have extremely low barriers for becoming somebody who is able to produce their own electricity. This leads to us overachieving our renewable targets uh, consistently. And I just quoted some old figures. In 2000, the target for 2010 was 12.5%. The target was reached in 2007, three years early, with 14.7%. And actually, just uh, uh, in September, we'll, we had the press release of our Ministry for the Environment that in the first half of 2011, we have been able to cover more than 20% of our electricity production uh, in Germany by renewables. Think back to my teachers and you see how times are changing. Obviously at this point the question is always who pays? Some uh, jurisdictions outside of Germany uh, finance uh, support schemes through uh, taxes. Uh, this is uh, not an appropriate scheme in my view because this, this is a, the talking power so uh, the person who pays for this should be the power user. It has nothing to do with your duty as a citizen to pay taxes. It has everything to do with your uh, role as a consumer of a basic good that is called electricity. So in Germany, the compensation mechanism is uh, done through the power user. And in this slide, you can see how, um, how uh, the power price structure in Germany has changed over the last 10 years. Oh. This brings me back to another similarity between Alberta and Germany. We also have completely deregulated power prices. Unusual for, you know, old Europe, but this is the way it is. Our power prices are done, are formed on a market. And you can see this in the red bar. This is what the power prices have been looking like over the last years. They have been increasing. First, the first period after we had the deregulation, power prices went down greatly. So power prices really gained, uh, reduced, were reduced by deregulation. But after uh, the companies had identified that power consumers in Germany are really too lazy to switch to a cheaper competitor, they started, you know, turning up the screw again. 
So uh, now they just price according to the willingness to pay, which means that they increase at an annual increment. <laughs> this doesn't give them many friends. So this, this also helps to explain to you the relationship between the German and their large four utilities. Basically, they hate each other. Germans don't like their utilities because of that, because they think the utilities are scamming them and they are taking off large amounts of money and they wouldn't have to. Still, don't, Germany, Germans don't switch a lot because electricity um, bills are by no means the highest, the largest energy bill that they have. They worry much more about car fuel, they worry much more about home heating. Electricity is the last one to worry about of the three, which explains why people don't switch. But what does this have to do with the cost of renewable electricity? If you look at the green part of these bars, that's the renewable energy charge. And yes, it has grown over the last 10 years uh, consistently and in line with uh, the growth of the renewable energy industry and the explosion of renewable energies in general. Obviously, this is of some concern, but as you can see in these slides, it kind of mixes with a number of other trends, so it's not enough to get people outraged. And in fact, a recent survey of the Ministry of the Environment among consumers has confirmed that Germans don't mind paying that amount and that Germans still like to have more renewables and like to, they support the policy of increasing and enhancing the renewable share of the German electricity bill. Because this whole national success story has a local component and this is, this is uh, what I was asked to talk about here, why and how do we have so many uh, people who support this? You can see it in the slide already. This is, um, I sent my father on a, on a shooting tour and he drove through my local, uh, through my home region and just took photographs. It's really, really easy to get a lot of photos with a very, uh, very short, on a very short drive with a lot of renewable energy facilities. You will not see any wind turbines because this is in the south of Germany where we don't have good wind. But you will see a lot of solar here. I don't know if you recognize this. This is all a huge PV array right next to the church tower in this village. And up here you have a solar water heater. I, I draw up some kind of a, a historic uh, path of how this came about that uh, solar is, uh, biomass are so pervasive in my region. Maybe I'm gonna tell you the story about when I grew up, uh, 4%, I told you already, but also we had these bumper stickers saying, who cares about nuclear power? Power is coming from my outlet. Uh, because the area was basically always rural and uh, next door there was another rural community that had just built a nuclear power plant. Obviously people in my region had, were feeling uneasy about being so close to a nuclear power plant but they were also feeling uneasy about losing out on this economic opportunity because they saw how the, how the sidewalks became gold-plated in this neighboring community. So people decided, I just don't want to think about it. And look at them now. Now we have um, uh, all of these farmers, which are the owners of these houses, are now diversifying into energy and are producing energy in order to have a second source of income. So the timeline of this uh, is in the early 90s when we started with this renewable uh, scheme that was allowing everybody to produce and, and uh, provide electricity to the utility. We had a number of individuals who were driving the uh, development on the national scale as well as locally. These were farmers who wanted to have one windmill on their farm or millers who had an old water ride. The mill had been um, not used for milling grain anymore because there were large milling f factories basically that were doing this. They were uh, bought by people who used them as their vacation home. But these vacation homers said, okay, well, I have a water ride. What do I do with it? Why don't I produce electricity? And these were the people who pushed in the early 90s to uh, get this law into place, modeled on the US PURPA Act and on a similar scheme in, in Denmark. And actually this came out of the Conservative Party and was just placed under the radar in, to some degree. If the utilities had really taken that serious at that point in time, they would have killed this law. They started waking up to what they perceived as a threat in 1994 or 1996 and they fought it tooth and nail. Every court uh, was, that was there, they went to and tried to do litigation. And these individuals that were the drivers and initiators really had to uh, fight a lot 
for being able to use their rights that they that were granted under this law. So changing coalitions and favor, um, favoring uh, parties in the government made it possible that the law was not abolished even though the utilities tried to get this through. Um, but the it, projects grew in size. So in the 1990s, uh, the projects were too large for single farmers or single millers to afford them. And also there were increasing NIMBY issues. People didn't like wind turbines next to their home. So uh, they tried to develop cooperative models that uh, allowed them to raise larger stakes of finance because people would give a share into the co cooperative. And also uh, when people saw that this windmill next door was actually, whenever it turned, was generating cash for them, they would re that would reduce the NIMBY issues a lot. So in the late 1990s, these cooperative models came up as investment first into wind farms and then were transferred to, to biomass and solar regimes. Um, in biogas, we also have a similar movement, but obviously in the farmer, uh, farming community, we have a traditional cooperative model, which was then also transferred to, to biogas investments. And so you can see six steps, how this single action went into a more coordinated action. And we now have a, a real movement among municipalities, municipalities that push it forward. We have the pioneers, then we had the poolers who, who were pooling the equity in order to uh, produce larger, larger projects. Uh, they were together with the participators who used pooling as a means to gain public support. And then there were the partnering aspects where uh, financiers went together with people who provided the feedstock, for example, for um, biogas. And lastly, we had the politicians who said, oh, isn't that nice? Everybody's making money. I can make a political idea around this and, and gain support. Maybe they even had, uh, had a facility themselves. And by now, we're at the stage where the politicians actually put in place public procurement rules, for example, for um, providing public facilities with renewable energy instead of normal uh, background gray energy or move towards 100% communities. Uh, an example for this uh, citizens wind park idea is Nibel, a place along, uh, close to the North Sea with 9,300 9, citizens. Uh, in 2007 they initiated a town meeting where they said, okay, why don't we do that? And around 850 of the nine, uh, about 10% almost, of these people then participated and raised the overall financing of three million. The rest was then financed from banks and it was completed in May 20, uh, 2011. We had overall 15 megawatts now produced. And this is probably enough to provide the whole town of Nibel with electricity. The first three steps were the pioneers and the participators. And in 2000, the scheme was opened for solar and for biogas. So from then on, we had a whole movement that I call the homegrown energy movement, which uh, builds on this uh, cooperative thinking in the rural areas. For example, in the Energiegemeinschaft Weißer with 240 members, they uh, sold 14,000 share and invested in a common, in a joint municipal um, photovoltaic system. Or Burger Energy Tübingen is interesting because actually in this case, the initiators were the local cooperative banks who were thinking we could put, in, put together a nice fund and market the fund to people who, rich professors in Tübingen, for example. So uh, even the banks are fully hooked onto the scheme. But uh, in fact, the, the underlying idea is obviously that renewable energy can close the local economic cycles. And this is again a um, picture from my home area where you see a biogas digester in the front. Um, here you see the, the cornfields in the forefront and then in, behind there you see actually a mill that's probably also uh, engaged in some kind of um, hydropower production. And then you see that all the roofs, instead of red, they are turning blue. Hydro facilities, this is another mill in my home area, which has just been revamped. Solar PV, lots and lots. The homegrown energy advantages are obviously, it's owned locally, you have local installers install it. Every third electrician in Germany is now able to do solar and active in the solar field. Um, local technicians maintain it and local farmers provide the fuels. Communities benefit from re increasing their tax revenues and in some cases even the technology is produced locally. 
uh, in the US, for example, they, they did a lot of this green jobs movement on the basis of investment subsidies and attracting factories to, uh, to their local place. I don't think, this is definitely one strategy, but I don't think it's the, the most useful strategy because by, by turning the, the uh, game from its head on its toes, you can actually first generate the demand and then also you will, you will have more uh, suppliers come there and, and invest in factories. This is my uncle. I would not have him change a light bulb, but he produces electricity. This is the school that my mother was a teaching, teacher at. At one day, the local electrician said to the, to the director of the school, hey, you have a nice roof. I have a couple of friends who have some money. I can provide a solar system. And so now the school has a solar system on its roof. And obviously, this is also used for educational purposes. And kids ask, why do we have a blue roof? And teachers can explain to them. So p politicians obviously see the local aggregate. We in Berlin, we see you know, the aspects of the law and the three pillars. But if you, if you live through this on a local level, you see, OK, well, this is this and this and this. This is a good idea. We can do more of that locally. So we have a whole movement now of, of mayors and of 100% regions, as they call themselves, that put together long-term plans, how, how they will be able to provide their communities uh, fully with renewable energy. So for example, Planek with 10,000 inhabitants is, is symptomatic because this is the type and the size of community where you can do this. It's somewhat rural. Already in 96, the municipality initiated incentives for the deployment of renewable energies. And since 2001, the municipal build, uh, buildings are supplied by 100% renewables. But that wasn't enough. In 2003, they founded the Association of Wurmthaler Innovative Energien and developed another nine citizen solar parks until today. And by the end of uh, 2011, they will uh, found their own public regional utility because they find that the nationwide utilities are putting in place administrative hurdles that they don't see are rational. So they think if they, could, if they would do it themselves, people would become easier. Another example is Munich, uh, which is probably uh, most comparable to Edmonton in the scale. In Munich, uh, the, national, the, the uh, utility was E.ON, which you might also know. Uh, but the city of Munich said, OK, E.ON is nice, but we want to also be uh, participating in the energy business. And they founded the Stadtwerke München, basically an own municipal utility, which does not own the local grid, um, but still is a municipal enterprise. And um, Munich is a wealthy city, as you can see from the, uh, from the top line. But um, the city council has mandated this utility with providing enough electrici electricity to, to cater to all 800,000 Munich households and then eventually to all Munich power consumption, including all the industry. Munich is uh, the, the headquarters of BMW, so you can, uh, you can understand. And, and also two large universities, there's a lot of power consumption that is not done in the households. They mandated the, the Stadtwerke with investing uh, 500 million euros per year and uh, to do as much as possible in the city, but uh, they can also invest in other locations. So they go into offshore in the North Sea and in Spain they have parts of a concentrating solar power plant. But they, uh, in order to make more action happen in Munich themselves, they also have the Solar Initiative in München, Solar Initiative, which, is 300, which targets to put 300 megawatts on top of Munich roofs alone. So they have already reached uh, in September 2011 a production of 2.4 billion, so they're well on the way. Uh, they cover 800,000 households and the demand of the subway and the tram in Munich. But they uh, have large-scale um, further plans and they actually cooperate with one of the most established uh, wind project developers in Germany. If you look at the whole map of Germany, you can see that this is not, this is the biggest city that is engaging in, in this kind of endeavor. But all of these places are looking to develop plans, local and municipal plans, either for climate protection or for 
100% or some large share of renewable energy in their activity. And you can see that this national movement is very well complemented by a local movement because people do see the local advantages. I, I find this map impressive. Uh, here's another rendition of it. And just one last point that I uh, bring sometimes is that low electric rates do not necessarily mean low bills. Even if you look at different jurisdictions in the US, you have places that pride themselves of very low rates and that will never intervene in their power sectors because of that. But actually, um, does, that does not mean that their citizens are best off because so many covered, so many charges are sometimes covered in things that are not expressed in the local rates. So really, if, if you encounter that argument that electric rates are rising because of renewable energy, you do want to look closely what exactly that means. Summing up, uh, we have significant municipal level action in Germany, which was not necessarily there in the beginning, but is now, uh, uh, is now being reinforced as, as municipalities understand that the national movement towards renewable energy is something that uh, resonates well with their local uh, objectives. Um, these uh, benefits are that we have enhanced local community and this is, this is pervasive through established structures in the industries, established banks, it's established electric contractors, it's established sanitary contractors. It's uh, the same old farmers that had these bumper stickers are now producing 40% of the electricity in my home area. These farmers in their rural communities, which are not really you know, densely populated, they now build uh, district heating grids from one stable to the other because they say, okay, I have a CHP that's fired with biogas. I need to, do, uh, to find a sink for my heat. I need to have somebody who, who pays, for, pays me for the heat. So they build uh, local district heating grids on their own uh, dime. And, and the municipalities and the local policymakers have understood that this is uh, a positive movement and they can uh, improve not only their image but also municipal finances and ultimately the quality of life in their communities. Uh, success factors for these schemes are obviously the long contract length. This is uh, not necessarily unique to uh, standard offer programs. You can as well think of a long power purchase agreement with a municipal consumer like a hospital or a school. So it's not necessary for this municipal act to happen that you have this kind of national policy frame. Even that the rate is pegged at the equipment cost and out, uh, is, is, not, is not unusual in, in private to private transaction. You don't need a law to do that. It's nice to have a law because it makes it easy, but you, you don't need to have it. It's important though that this rate is pegged, uh, is, is paid by output, that you don't uh, that you don't incentivize installations that do not work, but you want to have the incentive put on the actual product. There's also something like a lemming effect, I called it kind of facetiously. It's just, you know, I want what she has. You know, somebody has, starts with having a solar roof, other people say, hey, that's cool, I want it too. And it's relatively easy to add renewables. It's much easier than weatherizing your home or really checking out where in your home the, the electricity sink is, where is the, the, the power guzzler that you want to replace. Adding renewables on top of your roof is relatively easy and the law makes it even easier. My uncle, it took him three letters, one to the uh, utility, one to his electrical contractor, one to his bank, and that was it. And uh, in some cases, procuring renewable electricity now is cheaper because of the pricing behavior of our utilities that I described to you earlier. The green power retailers now just form their price by taking the local dominant rate of the established provider and selling their power one cent less. So most of the time you save by switching to a green power provider. I still haven't understood the economics of that, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to do. So don't ask me how this works. Uh, but it works.